This is our third video in our series on vertebrate diversity. In this video, we're going to look at the class Amphibia. As we've been working our way up through the vertebrates, the first major evolutionary advancement was the gaining of a jaw, and then a bony skeleton, and now we're going down this branch of those vertebrates with a bony skeleton that have legs, or are tetrapods, four limbs. Within the tetrapods, those vertebrates with limbs, we have to ask the question, do we have an amniotic egg? Yes or no? When we go down the no branch, we get to the class amphibia. The first thing we need to do is look at what the word amphibia means. Amphi means dual. Bia, bios, bio, means life. Dual life. Now think about what you know about amphibians and see if that makes sense. The defining characteristic of this class of animal is that they live part of their life in water, and dependent on water, and part of their life on land. These are the frogs and toads, the salamanders, and the legless salamanders. And this, in this uh, class, I'm going to ask you to know the specific orders, or these three orders. The order Anura for the frogs and toads, the order Uridella for the salamanders, and the order apoda for the legless salamanders. A lacking poda pods legs appendages legless the legless salamanders. Now the biggest thing for us here is that the amphibians represent for us a transition. Not only do amphibians go through a transition from water to land, but for us they represent the transition from the fish to the terrestrial animals and they are in between. All amphibians must start their life in water. They're tadpoles. The tadpoles are fish-like in that they uh, swim and they have gills and they, they couldn't exist on land. They don't have limbs. They have fins. So they have to start out in water. But they go through a metamorphosis where they change, growing limbs, reducing a tail, in the frog at least, and, be, and, and developing lungs. There's also going to be a change in the uh, the circulatory system that uh, goes along with this change. So those are all the things we need to investigate is how this transition within one life from water onto land, but also how that represents in the evolutionary stance the transition for um, vertebrates from water onto land. So it's a nice parallel case study for us. So again, the most obvious ex uh, characteristic of these animals is that they are dependent on water for reproduction. They must reproduce in water. Uh, the egg that they lay is uh, not an amniotic egg. It cannot survive outside of water. So for the first time in this group, we're going to see uh, limbs, and we're going to see lungs, and we're going to see a change in the circulatory system as they move from uh, the aquatic tadpoles into the adult uh, terrestrial animal. Uh, must return to water for reproduction, external fertilization, and uh, the metamorphosis is a kind of a major characteristic. Uh, the skeletal system, when we move on to land, the skeletal system has to become thicker. It's got to support the physical weight of the body, whereas in water, the weight is carried uh, by the water itself. Kind of like when we talked about plants moving on to land, uh, the necessity for uh, internal structural support became more important. Uh, here we're going to see the, the bones of the amphibian, the adult amphibian, being thicker and more sturdy to carry the weight compared to those of the a fish. We're also going to see the development of the pectoral and pelvic girdle to help attach the limbs to the axial skeleton. While we have these three specific orders, um, we certainly need to know which ones are which. We, um, we definitely are going to use the, the frog, the anura, as kind of the poster child to represent all amphibians for us. Um, we look at the general anatomy of a frog, for example, uh, to kind of represent amphibians. We're going to notice a couple of interesting things. First of all, uh, in terms of just characteristics, uh, the amphibians, like fish, are ectotherms, meaning that their temperature depends upon the environment. Well, we said that with fish, this isn't that big of a deal because their aquatic environment's uh, temperature doesn't change very drastically, or if it does, it doesn't change very fast. But living on land, uh, the air temperatures can change pretty rapidly, uh, and that presents a problem for many amphibians. As a result, they're limited in the habitat that they can, they can inhabit. And those that do live in uh, areas where temperatures can be more extreme, cold or hot, have developed some behavioral techniques to kind of handle that temperature, maybe estivating, digging down in the mud if it's too hot, or um, hibernating, digging down in the mud when it's too cold. 
uh, and being underground. Uh, we know that the amphibians have to develop some sensory and nervous system uh, things that are a little different than being in water. Uh, vision becomes much more important eyesight on land than it is in water. Um, sense of smell also, but uh, we know that uh, frogs can hear. We know that frogs can hear because they vocalize. When we look at this diagram of a frog, there's a structure called a tympanum right here, and it's a thin membrane stretched over the opening to the ear canal. Um, they don't have an external opening, but this membrane can vibrate or pick up vibrations from the air and transmit them to the inner ear structure for hearing. And we know that frogs have vocal cords uh, to vocalize, so uh, vocal communication is very important in, in frogs. Uh, frogs are predatory, so a good eyesight, keen eyesight is important uh, for that type of a lifestyle. One of the more subtle changes that we don't talk about too much, but uh, it's interesting, when we look at the digestive system, when they're tadpoles, uh, they're herbivores, meaning they feed on vegetable matter, and it, uh, as adults, they're carnivores, they feed on uh, you know other animals, so, uh, insects and such. But the herbivores have a, a longer digestive system. The length of the intestine uh, relative to the overall size of the body is larger in herbivores than it is in carnivores, and we see this change uh, from the larva to the adult. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about the, the function of the kidney now, but if you think about the job of the kidney uh, to get rid of metabolic waste and also eliminate excess water, uh, when we live on land, excess water is not near as much of a problem as not enough water, and so kidneys have to evolve a, a way to conserve water, and uh, the uh, terrestrial uh, adult versions of the amphibians have to deal with this uh, water conservation issue, so the, the function of the kidneys to do that is a very important idea. Now when we get to the circulatory system uh, of the amphibians, we have to stop and draw some pictures, but the, uh, the circulatory system of the tadpole is much like that of a fish. It's a two-chambered heart uh, with a single loop. But in the adult amphibian, we have a much different system. We have a three-chambered heart, and the system has two loops, which is interesting. So we need to draw a diagram to see why. But think about what's different between the tadpole and the adult we're going from gills to lungs and in that change from gills to lungs it alters the shape of the circulatory system because we have to send the blood to the lungs uh, to be oxygenated rather than to the gills so let's draw some pictures now remember what we're going to draw here is again a schematic diagram meaning it's not what it really looks like but it shows us the parts we need to know so we'll start off by drawing the heart and the amphibian adult amphibian heart is a three-chambered heart so we're going to draw a structure that looks like this. There's one chamber. Here's another chamber. And here's the third chamber. And we'll make this at the top. Uh, something like this. So there's our three-chambered heart. So we'll add to this and you'll, you'll see it kind of uh, comes together as we move along. But uh, here's our heart and we have three chambers. We have a right atrium and we have a left atrium. Now you may be stopping right now saying, um, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Savage, you got this wrong because you just put the right on the left and the left on the right. And while I may have a little dyslexia, it's just true, um, we're not looking at it from our perspective. Look at it from the perspective of the frog. This side is the frog's right, and this side is the frog's left. So I actually have labeled them correctly. And the third chamber is the ventricle. So we have three chambers, two atria and one ventricle. Now if we remember from our fish video, the atria always receive blood, and the ventricle are going to send blood on. So we got to think about where we're receiving blood from. We have to receive and send blood to both the body and the lungs. So let's put the lungs out here and the body out here. When the ventricle compresses, it squeezes blood. Whoops, pick this up again. It squeezes blood out to both the lungs and the body. So the blood comes out to the lungs where it picks up oxygen and becomes oxygen-rich blood and that blood returns to the heart in what we call the pulmonary loop. The blood that gets pumped out to the body goes out to the body, drops off oxygenated blood, picks up oxygen-poor blood, and returns to the heart 
in what we call the systemic loop because it goes out to the body's systems. Now, let's think about what's good and bad about this system. Let's look at where the blood is oxygenated or oxygen rich and when it's oxygen poor. In the lungs, the blood picks up oxygen. So we're going to draw the oxygen rich blood in red. That oxygen rich blood returns from the lungs into the left atrium. The left atrium then pumps that oxygen rich blood into the ventricle. The ventricle then compresses and squeezes that oxygen rich blood out. Now notice that some of the oxygen rich blood goes right back to the lungs. That's a little inefficient, we were just there. But some of that oxygen rich blood goes out to the body, and that's a good thing because we want to send blood oxygen out to the uh, body's cells and organs. Now, when the blood comes out to the body, oxygen's used up. And so the blood that comes back from the body is relatively oxygen poor, so we draw oxygen poor blood in blue. And blood from the body enters into the right atrium. The right atrium pumps that blood into the ventricle, and the ventricle pumps that blood out. Now notice some of that oxygen poor blood goes back to the body. That's not very efficient. We just came from there. But some of that oxygen poor blood goes to the lungs where it gets oxygenated. Now the issue is that in the ventricle we have this mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So that some of the blood going back to the lungs is oxygenated and some of the blood going back out to the body is oxygen poor, and it's some kind of a mixture. Now this is not the most efficient system. This is somewhat inefficient. So let's think about this in summary. We have a three-chambered heart and a dual circulation, or two loops. Well, what's going to make up for this inefficiency? To look to that answer, we need to look at gas exchange. As larva the amphibians use their gills for gas exchange. But as adults, they have a pair of lungs. And they engage in what's called positive pressure breathing. And I'll describe that in just a moment. But in addition to their lungs, and this is very important, they have additional gas exchange across their smooth skin. And their skin does not have scales. There are no scales. And it must be kept moist. Their skin acts as a secondary gas exchange surface. And it makes up the, for the inefficiency of the circulatory system. Now let's look at this frog. Now I know you're thinking, wow, uh, his art's gotten better until you see that uh, it's possible that I just traced that. Anyway, here's our frog, and I've drawn the lungs. I have a pair of lungs. And so the question is, how do you get air down into the lungs? And the answer is called positive pressure breathing. The frogs actually have to push the air down into their lungs. So they open their mouth and open their nostrils and they take a gulp of air. Then they close their nostrils, close their mouth, and push the bottom and top of their mouth together and push the air in. And these two lungs, like little balloons, inflate. And while they inflate, we exchange gases across the lining of the, of the lungs. They take oxygen in and drop off carbon dioxide. And then when they open their mouth, just like opening the end of the balloon, the air rushes out uh, in a, a positive push out. So it's called positive pressure breathing, which is different than the way you breathe. If you think about it, you don't push air down to your lungs. In fact, you pull it from below with a diaphragm, but the amphibians don't have that. In addition to these lungs, again, we have additional gas exchange across the skin. And this makes up for the inefficiency of a circulatory system where oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mix in the single ventricle. So to finish up, here's a little quiz I have for you. Could you label 1 through 7 in this diagram? Okay, well we made some advancements. We've moved on to land, we've gained limbs, we've gained lungs, we've built a sturdier skeletal system, we've got three chambered hearts instead of a two chambered heart, but we're still handicapped in some way in terms of movement onto land. The amphibians must return to water, they begin their life in water, they're limited in some respects. So in the next video we'll head down the road to the amniotes and we'll talk about the amniotic egg and how that allowed for animals to be truly terrestrial. In the next video, we'll take on the reptiles.